Okay. <clears throat> okay, let's, uh, let's open with prayer. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we thank you as always for this wonderful Sabbath day, which is swiftly approaching, and we uh, pray, Father, that we do take this time to understand that you are the creator of the universe. You are the one that's in complete control, and we pray, uh, Father, you open our hearts and our minds to your word, as we pray as your humble servants. Amen. We're on uh, Numbers chapter 35. This is a good chapter. The first three verses of Numbers 35. Now Yahweh spoke to Moses in the plains of Moab by the Jordan opposite Jericho, saying, Command the sons of Israel that they give to the Levites from the inheritance of their possession cities to live in, and you shall give to the Levites pasture lands around the cities, and the cities shall be theirs to live in, and their pasture lands shall be for their cattle and for their herds and for all their beasts. So now, not all the Levites were occupied in the tabernacle. They, uh, they were given 48 cities and pasture lands in which to live. Now, they, uh, while they couldn't own property, they did, they did live in houses <clears throat> that they owned. Verses 4 and 5. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is, keep in mind, this is the land they're settling in, they're talking about. Uh, well, I mean, Moses isn't, but he's, he's telling them, you know, they're about to settle into the land. They're just opposite Jericho. Yeah, they're not wandering, this is not about, about wandering in the wilderness. Yes, and he's about to go. He's about to go. Uh, yeah, go to the top of the mountain and look and, and be gone. But he's going to Deuteronomy is going to be a final retelling of, of things before he does that. <clears throat> Verses four and five, and the pasture lands of the cities which you shall give to the Levites shall extend from the wall of the city outward a thousand cubits around. You shall also measure outside the city and on the east side 2,000 cubits and on the south side 2,000 cubits and on the west side 2,000 cubits and on the north side 2,000 cubits with the city in the center. This shall become theirs as pasture lands for the cities. Now, um, verses 4 and 5 have been debated for centuries as to uh, possibly being contradictory to one another, but this claim is without merit. It's not... Uh, it's not too difficult. The treasury of scripture knowledge states this. <clears throat> it says, uh, various modes have been proposed for reconciling the accounts in these two verses, which appear in general to require full, as much explanation as the text itself. The explanation of Maimonides is uh, one that is intelligible and appears perfectly satisfactory. The suburbs, says he, of the cities are expressed in the Torah to be 3,000 cubits on every side from the wall of the city and outwards. The first 1,000 cubits are the suburbs, and the 2,000 which they measured without the suburbs were for fields and vineyards. The whole, therefore, of the city, suburbs, fields, and vineyards may be represented by this diagram here that I'm showing. <clears throat> um, and that 1,000 cubits square, that's going to be well over 50 acres. There, and it's going to be, what, 48 of these? So, there's plenty. Verse 6. And the cities which you shall give to the Levites shall be the six cities of refuge, which you shall give for the manslayer to flee to. And in addition to them, you shall give 42 cities. <clears throat> um, so, out of these 48 cities the Levites had, six of them were going to be declared as cities of, of refuge. And we're going to talk about those some more. Verses 7 and 8. Now all the cities which you shall give to the Levites shall be 48 cities together with their pasture lands. As for the cities which you shall give from the possession of the sons of Israel, you shall take more from the larger, and you shall take less from the smaller. Each shall give some of his cities to the Levites in proportion to his possession, which he inherits. So the larger tribes will have more cities, the smaller tribes 
Uh, we'll give a smaller number of cities. Um, if Elohim gives you more, you're responsible for more. That's the way it is. Um, that's just one of the principles by which Elohim operates. In uh, Luke 12, verses 47 and 48, And that slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will shall receive many lashes. But the one who did not know it and committed deeds worthy of a flogging will receive but a few. And from everyone who has been given much, much shall be required. And to whom they entrusted much of him, they will ask all the more. So, let's go to verses 9 through 12. Then Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When you cross the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall select for yourselves cities to be your cities of refuge, that the manslayer who has killed any person unintentionally may flee there. And the cities shall be to you as a refuge from the avenger, so that the manslayer may not die until he stands before the congregation for trial. Elohim does not permit vigilante justice among his people. These cities of refuge were designed to prevent such a thing from ever happening. Happening. A man is not to be put to death unless he faces the government and gets a trial. Verses 13 through 15. And the cities which you are to give shall be your six cities of refuge. You should give three cities across the Jordan and three cities in the land of Canaan. They are to be cities of refuge. These six cities shall be for refuge for the sons of Israel, excuse me, and for the alien and for the sojourner among them, that anyone who kills a person unintentionally may flee there. Now there are to be six cities of refuge, and you spread them out. Give someone a chance to make it there, no matter where they are within the land. And they put three on east of the Jordan and three west of the Jordan, uh, to give as good of access as possible. Verses 16 through 18. But if he struck him down with an iron ob object so that he died, he's a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. And if he struck him down with a stone in the hand by which he may die, and as a result he died, he is a murderer. The murderer shall be put to death. Or if he struck him with a wooden object, in the hand by which he may die, and as a result he died, he's a murderer, the murderer shall surely be put to death. This is an explicit definition of murder. If someone intentionally strikes someone with a weapon that could possibly kill him, it's murder. But I didn't mean to kill him, I just mean to hurt him. Okay, I just wanted to hurt the guy. If he dies, you're a murderer. That's, uh, that's the way it is. It doesn't matter what your intent was. If you strike someone to hurt them and they die, you are a murderer, and murderers are to be put to death. Uh, what if they did something, you know, that, like, hurt his family and he defended his family, you know, and killed him? Well, what do you mean? Well, no, defending his family, that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about defending his family. This, this is a guy you're mad at, you hate, you hit, you hit him with something. That's what this is referring to. <clears throat> Verses 19 through 21. Well, good to see you. The blood avenger himself shall put the murderer to death. He shall put him to death when he meets him. And if he pushed him of hatred or threw something at him lying in wait, and as a result he died. Or if he struck him down with his hand in enmity. What's enmity? Don't, you haven't used that word the last couple days, have you? Enmity. Hmm? Extreme hatred, yes. <clears throat> and, and if he struck him down in, with his hand in enmity, and as a result he died, the one who struck him shall surely be put to death. He's a murderer. The blood avenger shall put the murderer to death when he meets him. So, that's the relatives. The blood avenger or close friend or the, of the victim shall put the murderer to death. Um, you know, uh, there is a, such a thing as a hate crime. All right? Only it's not what we call it today. Uh, this, is, this is worse than that. It's a crime done out of hate or anger. If, uh, if that person 
hated the person he killed. He's a murderer. Scripture is showing us the root of sin here in verse 20 in particular. It's hate in a man's heart that is sin. Without the hate, he's not a murderer. <clears throat> um, it's the hate in his heart that makes him a murderer. Look at Leviticus 19, verses 17 and 18. You shall not hate your fellow countrymen in your heart. You may surely reprove your neighbor, but shall not incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am Yahweh. You know, Yeshua told us the same thing. In uh, Matthew 5, verses 21 and 22, and I want to discuss these here for just a minute. You've heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court, and whoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court, and whoever shall say, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. <clears throat> the passage in verse 21, whoever commits murder shall be liable in the court. That's not a quote from the Tanakh. Notice that it's not capitalized. The one that's capitalized is you shall not commit murder. This thing about being liable to the court, that's their tradition that they did. <coughs> now, Yeshua speaks of murder, then he speaks in progression of the feeling, feelings and reactions that leads to murder. And also he includes a level of guiltiness to each one. He says, first of all, if you're angry with your brother, you're guilty before the court. And the Greek word there for court is uh, chrysis, and it essentially means tribunal. And he says, uh, if, you're, if one calls his brother Raka, he shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. Now, Raka means stupid, empty-headed, or a fool. And the Greek word for uh, Supreme Court there is the Sanhedrin. And Yeshua uh, then says, whoever says you fool shall be guilty in the fiery hell. Now, the Aramaic term for fool is, uh, is moros, which is likely a transliteration of the Hebrew term mora, which means rebel. And this term is used by Moses of, of Israel when his disobedience, their disobedience entered, uh, prevented them from entering the promised land. That's what he called them. <clears throat> to call someone you fool is not only to say that person is rebellious, as in disobedient to the Father, but it's saying that person doesn't believe that there is an Elohim. Because if you use it in, a, in the manner the Scripture intends, you can see what it means. Uh, first of all, this is uh, it's a, it's a, uh, a word very almost identical to the one used in Numbers 20, verse 10. Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly before the rock, and he said to them, Listen now, you rebels, shall we bring forth water for you out of this rock? Now, they were rebelling against the Father. <clears throat> as far as calling someone a fool, Psalm 14, verse 1 says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no Elohim. You're claiming that person claims Elohim doesn't exist by calling them a fool. They're corrupt. They've committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. In uh, Proverbs 1, verse 7, the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. To call someone a fool in that context is to say you despise the words of the Father. Um, Proverbs 1, verse 22, How long, O naive ones, will you love simplicity? And scoffers delight themselves in scoffing, and fools hate knowledge. That's knowledge of the Father, knowledge of his ways. Uh, to call someone a fool in the context that they're speaking of, they're saying, you hate the Father, you hate his ways, you believe he doesn't even exist. That's why such a strong emphasis on these words and calling your brother these words. <clears throat> that is the, uh, that's the context with which he's coming from. Now, John tells us that Hate in our heart already makes us a murderer. In 1 John 3, verse 15, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. 
And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. It's this hate thing. That's a big thing. You know, it's so important. Be slow to anger. And don't even go the hate route. Okay? Just leave the hate alone. What is it? When did it ever benefit you to, to, to hate? Did it ever benefit you? I, I, don't, I can't think of a beneficial reason to hate. <clears throat> it just doesn't. It just doesn't compute. We are to love our brothers and sisters in Israel. Now, I often say our emotions are not sin. All right, for the most part, that's true. But it's not exactly true. It's not true in the, the Christian form that we're familiar with. <clears throat> uh, to hate a brother, which is an emotion, that's a sin. To covet your neighbor's wife is a sin. So... Yeshua said to lust after a woman in your heart is adultery. What he's referring to, and, and you know, your normal Baptist thinks that he can't look at any women anymore. He's just got to kind of keep his head down. And at least if she's looking, he can't look. So, or if another Baptist is looking at him, he can't look. And he can't drink a beer if another Baptist is looking at him. But when he's by himself, you know. <clears throat> but no, that's not what he's speaking of at all. He's speaking of coveting your neighbor's wife. Not just desiring women. For instance, Matthew 5, verses 27 and 28, you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks on a woman to lust for her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. Uh, well, it's adultery, therefore she's married. One. And lust doesn't mean, whoo! Okay, and then you move on. No, it means, <laughs> it means you have intent. You have intent to do that which you should not do. <clears throat> and with that intent, and with that being a married woman, it's adultery. Okay, does that make sense? The hate thing, uh, there's, there's going to be more, uh, more detail on that too, as far as what constitutes a manslayer and what constitutes a murderer. See, it, people think, well, Yeshua here was just taking the Ten Commandments to another level. No, he wasn't. He's explaining them. That's all he's doing. Just explaining them, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. That's all he's saying here. <clears throat> and he equates that to adultery. And that's fair enough. They're both in the ten words. Let's look at verses 22 through 24. But if he pushed him suddenly without enmity, or threw something at him without lying in wait, or with any deadly object of stone and without seeing it dropped on him so that he died while he was not his enemy nor seeking his injury, then the congregation shall judge between the slayer and the blood avenger according to these ordinances. We are to differentiate between the murder, murderer and the accidental manslaughterer. If someone is pushed accidentally or if a man is accidentally killed in any way without intention, and it is not known that the man who did it hated the guy that, was, that died. Then the government shall judge between the man who committed these actions and the avenger of blood. <clears throat> um, so you see the difference between an accidental manslayer and murder. If, for instance, it's known that you hate the man, and you went out into the forest and you cut some wood with him, and the axe head flew off and killed him. Guess what? You're, you're dead. You're a murderer. If it's known that you hated him and he, you killed him accidentally, even, you're a murderer. If the hate isn't there, the axe head flies off and the guy dies. Even when somebody saw the axe head fall off? I said, they're alone. They're alone. But you better, you, uh, if the hate's there, I wonder if he rigged that axe handle to fly off. I think we need to look into that. You know, you know what I mean? You, you, you best just leave the anger and the hate away. Just put it away. Yes, yes. You're, you're, you're toying with a scorpion. Now, why do you want to toy with a scorpion? And, and I'm not saying you got big boots on. No, you're, you're getting your fingers out there and you're playing with a scorpion when you get that hate. 
going. You just, just don't do it. Not wise. Verse 25. And the congregation shall deliver the manslayer from the hand of the blood avenger, and the congregation shall restore him to his city of refuge to which he fled, and he shall live in it until the death of the high priest who was anointed with the holy oil. Such an interesting passage. If the manslayer is declared innocent, then the manslayer shall be safely delivered to and shall dwell in one of the cities of refuge. Now, why should he be forced to stay in the city of refuge? That's family, that guy's family is still out there. Okay? This is going to take some cooling off. Now, he's not, a, he's not a prisoner. I mean, he's city. He's still eat, drink. He's free. But he needs to stay within that city. He's not a murderer. Not a murderer. He is not a murderer. But he has to stay in that city until the death of the anointed high priest. After that, he can return to the land of his inheritance. This is a beautiful picture of Yeshua and the deliverance we have through his death as our high priest. Look what the writer of Hebrews has to say, and I believe that was Paul. Hebrews 9, starting at verse 12, And not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleaning of the flesh, <clears throat> excuse me, how much more will the blood of Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to Elohim, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living Elohim? New covenant? You see, you see the new covenant everywhere when Paul writes? You really do need to see it. That's what he just, that's what he just said right there in verse 14. Cleanses your conscience from dead works to... Serve the living Elohim. That's the breath of the Father within you. Yeah. If he's cleansed our conscience, doesn't that mean that we need to forgive it to let it go? Well? Yes. Instead of keep beating ourselves up over it. Instead of keep beating yourself up over it. That's exactly right. Verse 15, he continues, For this reason he is a mediator of a new covenant, in order that since death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. See, he ties it all in with the death of the high priest. And in uh, Hebrews 10, starting at verse 19, Since therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Yeshua, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of Elohim, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faithfulness, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. New covenant, new covenant, new covenant. That's what that's referring to. <clears throat> Let's go back to Numbers. 35, verse 26. But if the manslayer shall at any time go beyond the border of his city of refuge to which he may flee. And the blood avenger finds him outside the border of his city of refuge. And the blood avenger kills the manslayer. He shall not be guilty of blood. But he should have remained in the city of refuge until the death of the high priest. But after the death of the high priest, the manslayer shall return to the land of his possession. So the manslayer has to stay in that city of refuge until the death of the anointed high priest, or else the family of the victim can kill him. Give me that again now. In other words, the manslayer goes to the house of refuge until and then the priest dies. Okay, then he can get out. Looking for him. Yeah, but then, he, then, then he's allowed out. But the priest may not die for 20 years. Yeah, but he may die in a week. He may die in a week, right. So they could kill him to be all right? Kill. You know, once the priest dies and he, he leaves. Uh, then they can't kill him. Okay, okay. That's then they can't kill him. Then they'll be guilty. Yeah, they'll be guilty of murder. <clears throat> See, if, if one rejects the refuge that we have under Messiah, this is what they're doing. They're, neglect, they're rejecting the refuge they have in the, the city of refuge if they leave the city. Uh, that's their refuge. In the same way, if we reject the refuge we have through Messiah, 
We're lost and there is no hope. The writer of Hebrews continues uh, in Hebrews 10, verse 26. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who set aside the Torah of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severer punishment do you think he'll deserve who has trampled underfoot the son of Elohim and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the spirit of graciousness? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine and I will repay. And again, Yahweh will judge his people. <clears throat> Numbers 35, verses 29 and 30. And these things shall be for a statutory ordinance to you throughout your generations in all your dwellings. If anyone kills a person, the murderer shall be put to death at the evidence of witnesses. But no person shall be put to death on the testimony of one witness. The death penalty for murderers is a punishment that should be enacted throughout all generations in all governments. It's one of the foundations of a functional society. To take the, take, you take the life of a murderer. Um, okay, a lot of people say, well, you know, put yourself in his place. No, put yourself in the place of the victim. Okay? That's where you go first. Put yourself in the place of the victim. Now, if someone, if someone comes up to you with a knife and says, give me your money, and you give them, you have $100 in your wallet, you give it to them. Well, they're arrested. Let's assume there was justice. What would he have to do? Pay you back, Pay you back plus. plus. Right. If they're three witnesses, though, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. He'd have to pay you back. Okay. Well, someone comes up with a knife and takes your life. What do they owe? They owe more than they can pay, but they're going to pay what they got. They owe their life plus 20%. Or in the case of you compare it to sheep or cattle four or five times. Okay. They can't pay that back, but they're going to pay what they got. Eye for an eye. Tooth for tooth, life for life, justice. Justice. That's what it is. <clears throat> Verse 31. But and there's nothing more, there's nothing more fair and just and right than that. Verse 31, moreover, you shall not take ransom for the life of a murderer who's guilty of death, but he shall surely be put to death. No bail money for the murderer. He's not going to get out on bond and run away. No. Uh -uh. You know, the, it should be that no matter how good his lawyer is or how fancy his legal team, the murderer will be put to death. That's the way it needs to be. Verses 32 and 33. You shall not take ransom for him who's fled to a city of refuge, that he may return to live in the land before the death of the priest. So you shall not pollute the land in which you are, for blood pollutes the land, and no expiation can be made for the land for the blood that is shed on it, except by the blood of him who shed it. If a manslayer flees the city of refuge, there's no ransom or bail there either. He's fair, fair game. The death of the victim has polluted the land. There's no atonement for the land except by the blood of the man who shed the blood. That's a beautiful picture of the salvation and shelter we have under Yeshua Messiah as our high priest. Those who reject him and his salvation are without hope, and they have defiled the land. And they'll pay for that with their own blood. That's the way it is. You know, the writer of Hebrews, he's, he's uh, particularly hot too on these guys that reject Yeshua because they've been hounding him his whole, almost his whole life. Verse 34, And you shall not defile the land in which you live, in the midst of which I dwell. For I, Yahweh, am dwelling in the midst of the sons of Israel. The land is to be set apart, particularly because Yahweh dwells with his people in that land, and he will again someday soon. 
Any, uh, any questions or thoughts on Numbers 35? Mm -hmm. What if there's not a blood of um, You can find, it could be friends. It could be, you know, that's a, that's a good question that isn't really brought up. It really isn't answered. I'm just guessing. Now, the judges would decide who that would be. And it could be just the people as a whole. And that's normally who uh, took part in the stonings for the people as a whole. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, Cliff, 20 years is a, a short one. 20 years, you're rushing it. I don't know. The only one I know of that, that, was, that got the death penalty in less than 20 years was Timothy McVeigh. His was seven. That's because you could get a, you know, they didn't get his uh, Islamic cohorts, but they, they got him. <clears throat> but yeah, 20 years? I don't know. You got at least 20 years if you're on death row. What's that? Oh, yeah. Unless you live in California, then you got that lazy eight. Infinity. There is no death penalty officially there. That's when the family comes into play. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, was, uh, I forgot which movie I was watching. This guy's on death row. He admitted, yeah, I killed, I killed four dozen people. Yeah, I did it. And on my last meal, I wanted that steak. And then the guard brings him a steak. He said, I wanted this medium well. This thing's burnt to a crisp. He said, I'll do better next time. <laughs> Okay, let's take a break for about five minutes, and we're going to look at John 4. I love John 4. <laughs>